HRN listeners. As we celebrate our 15th year, we are deepening our commitment to giving voice to the next generation of food system storytellers, and we need your help. Our internship and fellowship programs help activate new possibilities for underrepresented and underestimated young people through experiential journalism, audio engineering, and production training. Through these unique programs, HRN helps food equity stewards build essential workforce readiness skills that expand their potential and foster economic mobility. Please consider supporting these critical programs. And with a minimum donation, you can be entered to win a dinner for two at an amazing restaurant in one of eight cities and tickets to a concert at a great venue in one of those cities. We have incredible partners across the country who have donated as they also share our passion for helping to educate the next generation of food system storytellers. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. And make sure you donate before March 31st. Thank you. I think that people need to taste, and they need to taste our best. I had a Bros 2002 Reserve Merlot, when I, and, and I was like, wow, Merlot is awesome in Virginia, and I really like it. The team and saying, I think, really might be uh, the best white grape variety for Virginia. Currently my favorite wine to grow into me. In Virginia, we, I think, have a much... We, ha- we kind of bridge two worlds, new world and old world, and we get the best of both. Yeah, we were a winery, I don't know, we were around 70 when we opened up, and there's like 280 now, something like that. It keeps growing. Yes, I am the only female here, and I'm probably the youngest here. <laughs> I try to work smarter, not harder. Most days I, I don't go to museums in Richmond and pour wine uh, for people. I, I wear Carhartts and I drive a tractor. And, and that's what we do. Uh, today is just a lot of fun. Welcome to Heritage Radio Network On Tour, broadcasting live from Fire, Flower, and Fork in Richmond, Virginia. I'm Lisa Held. And I'm Christine sykes Lowe. And we're about to jump into a special kind of speed dating, where we'll be getting to know all kinds of different Virginia wines. Before we kick off, we'd like to thank our sponsor, Virginia Wine, for making our coverage of the festival possible. I have the 2017 Albarino, which is a state-grown, which I'm very happy about. I think Albarino is going to be a really big grape for Virginia. Done a lot of research on the, um, oh, I don't know who that's for, but they can have it. There's one over there, too. Um, So we recently, a few years ago, I worked with NASA to uh, map Virginia meter by meter with all their satellites. Wow. And um, all the the data shows, like, like, look at, like, temperature, humidity, slope, ambient, reflective, all these different attributes with weather that the closest to us was northern Spain if you like draw have to draw like a correlation so I was like sweet I'm going to plant Albarino Um, and wasn't sure but now it's worked out really well and this was our this is our second our first vintage was not very big I just kind of picked a few of the grapes Um, so this I'm really happy with can you tell us your name and your winery oh yeah that'd be helpful Uh, Matthew and the Williamsburg Winery in Williamsburg, Virginia. Wonderful. Were you the first winemaker in Virginia to plant Albarino grapes then? No, no. There's okay. a, I was just talking to, to uh, Daniele, and he was saying that there are, it's not really prominent. I mean, there's probably 10 in the Charlottesville area of all the wineries that, have, that do have an Albarino. But I think I'm going to put plant more. Mm. So I think I'm going to really kind of focus it as a as a big varietal for us, right? Um, so I'll, I mean, I want to take it up to like two thousand cases, so I can do a, a large distribution throughout the Mid Atlantic and everything of Virginia Albarino. Great. So maybe we should taste it. I think you and should then we'll ask definitely taste it. Yeah. So you'll get it's very similar to the Portuguese and and, and Spanish Albarinos. So you, you get that minerality. Oh yeah. And that the acidity, but you get that nice fruit. Uh, yeah, the fruit Taste, is tasting a lot of peach in that. Yeah, yeah. Mm, so yeah. Which is really nice when you get that, that the fruit 
but then you also get the uh, the minerality and the that acidity. So, like for food pairings, it's it's easy. Uh, it's very complimentary. So, are there other Spanish grapes that you're thinking of trying? Grenache. Or have tried? Oh, interesting. Grenache, Tempranillo. I would plant Grenache just because I'm selfish and I like Grenache, and I thought, well, why not? Sometimes, you know, I get driven by factors that I probably shouldn't. And so what is this you're pouring? So this is the 2015 Adagio, which is a blend. It's Petit Verdot and Cabernet Franc, Merlot, and Tanat. Um, so this is our probably our boldest wine that we have as far as the structure, the body. Uh, it was the 2010 was the Gov- Virginia Governor's Cup winner. Uh, it does consistently score in the 90s from like Robert Parker and uh, Wine Enthusiast and Spectator. Mm. So it's just, it's, uh, I just consider it our, a our bold representation of that vintage. Mm. So I'll be very specific with the barrels. Mm-hmm. I do use a lot of front, new French oak barrels. I'll take the best vineyards of that vintage and, you know, hopefully make an expression of a bigger, bolder wine. And then we put it in a really big bottle, and that's about it. That's great. Yeah, I, I, it, it does really well. So what do you think you would want people outside of Virginia to know about the wine coming out of the state? That it's really, really good. And I've had this discussion. I have this discussion. I used to, be, I used to make wine in Napa Valley. And I, also, I, I, now, I still make wine in Argentina. Oh, wow. So I see a lot of different wines. And the thing that doesn't upset me, but I'm always perplexed by, is that in America, people think that California defines what a wine is should be. Like, so they have a Merlot, and it's like, oh, that's... So when they go somewhere else and have a Merlot, it's like, oh, that's not a California. And after I pick them up off the floor, I explain, you know, that California doesn't define Merlot. They define a particular style. Right. Uh, and they're all different around the world. So that's what I want people to realize, that there, there are wines that, yeah, it's not like a California Merlot, it's a Virginia Merlot. And when I was making wine in Napa, I never drank Merlot. I didn't drink Merlot from the United States until I came to Virginia. And I can tell you, I had, they're here, I had a Bros 2002 Reserve Merlot. When I, and, and I was like, wow, Merlot is awesome in Virginia, and I really like it. So... How is it different? Like, how would a Virginia Merlot compare to a California Merlot? Well, I think a lot of times in California, and I'm going to say this because even if my friends are listening to me, they can they can pick on me later, <laughs> is that sometimes in California, they treat everything like it's a Cabernet Sauvignon or it's mm. a big wine. And Merlot is not, it's not supposed to be a big wine. It's supposed to be more fruit forward, uh, more approachable, less tannins, less oak. Something that's just like, you know, nice you know, sitting on the porch. Easy drinking. Yeah, easy drinking yeah. goes well with lunch, and it's just a nice wine. And they try to make it this big, monstrous, like, Cabernet, because right. that's what they do. Um, so here in Virginia, we, I think, have a much... We ha- we kind of bridge two worlds, new world and old world, and we get the best of both. So we have... We're not new world. We're not California or Australia or Argentina, and we're not... France or Italy or Spain, but we have attributes of both new and old. And I think that's what people should know is that Virginia bridges that gap Mm. really well. Uh, So, you know, if you like either one of those styles, it's still our style is approachable. It's a very friendly style. We're a very friendly group of people here. What about your unique um, winemaking style, like in Virginia, like you specifically? Um, how is how would you describe what makes your vineyard or your winery unique? Well, the vin- I mean, everything. It's all. It's it's hard to say. I mean, I know our site. We do very well. Uh, when we could talk about the soil and the weather and all that, but it's it's relatively the same. We do mm-hmm. get the Shenandoah gets less rain. The Shenandoah Valley gets less rain than we do. But for me, um, oh, I don't oh, want to no. go. We ran out of time. <laughs> we ran out of time. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs>
Hi, my name is James Batterson, um, the winemaker, one of the owners of James River Cellars Winery. Uh, we're located 10 miles north of the city of Richmond, right off 95 on Route 1. Um, today I'll be pouring a 2017 Vidal Blanc and a 2016 Reserve Chamberson. Can you tell us a little bit about um, the grapes? Yeah, today I brought two hybrid grapes. Okay. Um, they're much easier to grow in the state because they're a high humidity. The Nefer has a lot of problems with disease. So these hybrids are designed to be more disease designed to be more disease resistant mm. so more consistent especially in tough rainy years like this so the 17 Vidal Blanc is um has a lot of grapefruit a uh, little bit of apricot a little pear touch of kiwi and it's very nice uh, mostly dry at 0.8 percent residual sugar let's give her a whirl right. yeah let's try it so what is unique about your overall winemaking style and uh, the wines compared to others from the region? Uh, we take a minimalistic approach. Uh, we try not to get overly complicated, let the fruit speak for itself. Since we grow the majority of our fruit, um, we're able to let it express itself. Is that rare that um, you grow most of the fruit here do, um, in terms of the wineries in Virginia? Uh, no, I think a lot of, well, I'd say it's 50-50. Okay. A lot, of, a lot of prior wineries, older wineries, grow most of their fruit. A lot of the newer wineries have, are leasing land, growing grapes. Um, a little bit of a Riesling uh, sort yeah, of a Yeah, similar style. Yeah. I mean, just a touch of residual sugar. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they have nice acid, good balance, and that crispness. from uh, It's all stainless steel aging, so no barrel aging. It's really nice. Tell us about the second wine. All right. Second wine is Reserve Chamberson. Chamberson's a French hybrid grape. It is, once again, fairly easy to grow in the state. Um, has nice deep color. Uh, it's much lower tannins than red vinifera. Um, I'm smelling the tobacco yeah, on the bouquet. So, yeah, that's from the barrel aging. So it's aged in a combination of French and American oak barrels. Uh, mostly older barrels, so it's not heavy, heavy oak. Mm -hmm. Since it's a low tannin wine, it won't take too much oak. Yeah. Uh, but keeps a lot of fruit, some berry, a lot of blackberry. Uh, this was our first dry chamberson we've done. We've been making a, or we, I've been making a sweet chamberson for years. Uh, it's probably one of our best selling wines. But I want to try to, since we're growing more chamberson, I want to see if I can make a dry red. Mm. And so far, so good. It's delicious. So this is speed dating. And um, if you were speed dating all of the Virginia wines, not your own, which would you take home with you? <laughs> That's here today? Yeah. It doesn't have to be here. Just, I, well. got, I, mean, I haven't had a chance to try the wines here today. <laughs> yeah. You don't have a favorite Virginia wine? I would probably wine? have to buy, get something from Sunset Hills because I bought some fruit for them for the first time in like five years. So mm. I could do a comparison to see how theirs work. There you go. What I make. <laughs> there you go. Um, what are some myths about Virginia wine that you want to debunk? Mm. Uh, they're a fair number. I guess some say they're not complicated, which mm. I don't think that's that's true. There's some, especially some of the, uh, I've had some fabulous whites from the eastern shore, have a lot of minerality that will stand up against fabulous French Chablis. Um, yeah, we heard there's an oyster wine yeah. tour on the Eastern Shore. Yeah, I've heard I really want to get in on had, that. I've had their wine; it's <laughs> fabulous. So, like, and it is oyster season now. So, right. <laughs> so our, our version of that is a stainless Chardonnay, but it's still not quite the same for that pairing. So, so if you were a wine, what kind of wine would you be? Um, well, my favorite grape that we grow is Gewürztraminer, so it's a little bit spicy. Ooh. Kind of difficult at times. Yes. Hard to work with, but. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. That's but a good one. The final product's pretty good. <laughs> Tell us a little bit more about your winery. So, you, you know, we tried your wines, but what makes your style unique, um, your vineyard unique? Uh, you know, we're, we're very close to the city of Richmond, so we try to have a, try to get people out there as a destination, even though it's a very short trip. Um, I don't know. We just started small. We never really planned on it to be anything. And then we finally took the big step and did a, after 16 years, and did a large expansion and um, took the risk. So we're hoping that'll 
tell, payoff. Tell us about term. your expansion. Uh, we tripled the size of the uh, tasting room, and that's impressive. Yeah, and I was I was making the wine in a little small building next door, in tiny little cramped quarters, and now we have a nice, <laughs> wonderful processing all underground in the basement. So temperature controlled, it's very nice. State no, of the no art. yellow jackets in processing this year. That was a first. <laughs> oh, you gotta <laughs> got tell to process it. inside. Oh, so we've always is pro- that a big we- problem? That yellow jackets and processing? Can you? Uh, not for the quality wine. It is for the um, for the winemaker. For, for the winemaker, right. <laughs> it's a big deal. <laughs> but there, it's a real like. There's a lot of them. And uh, as soon you as get- you start. Destemming, pressing grapes. So it's the it's sweetness. It's warm. Swarm. Wow. wow. Yeah, so this was the first year. They don't like going inside buildings. So I, I was able to process everything inside. So it just seems, it was nicer for me. Yeah. Well, and you said 16 years since, so you've been doing this a while. Yeah. We, uh, first harvest, I mean, first, yeah, harvest was 2000. Um, opened the winery in June of 2001. So just kind of is that hobby gone wild. It's always been the second job until now. Wow. Has the Virginia wine landscape changed a lot in that time since you started making wine? Yeah, we were winery, I don't know, we were around 70 when we opened up. And there's like 280 now, something like that. It keeps growing. My name is Corey Craighill, and I'm the winemaker at Sunset Hills Vineyard. And I'm pouring... Two wines today. I've got a Chardonnay, a 2017 Chardonnay, our Shenandoah Springs Clone 96 Chardonnay. And then I'm also pouring my 2015 Mosaic. Wonderful. Where is Sunset Hills? So Sunset Hills is located in Loudoun County. We're in, uh, specifically in Percival. Love Loudoun County. Yeah, it's, it's very pretty. It's so beautiful. Horse country. Yes, and wine country. Yes, <laughs> horse and wine country. Best of two worlds. Well, let's have a taste. Sure. So I'm going to pour you the Clone 96 Shard first. Thank you. Wow. So this wine really highlights um, sense of place in Virginia. Uh, as you, as I've said, uh, it's Shenandoah Springs, which is our site, one of our sites in the Shenandoah County. And not only is it vineyard specific, but it's also clone specific. So we grow three clones out there, 96, 76, and 17. So in, seven, in 2017, the clone 96, as it was ripening, um, I started getting this idea of, well, we, I always keep it separate in the cellar anyways, but I really liked the difference of the three. And as I followed it through ripening and through fermentation and aging, um, decided to, to bottle the 96 on its own. So That's wonderful. It's really, really delicious. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm going, I have a question for you. I think you're the only female winemaker here. What's that like being in the industry? Um, yes, I am the only female here, and I'm probably the youngest here. <laughs> uh, I try not to let um, being a female get in the way of anything. Um, I've worked a lot with men and women, and <laughs> I try to work smarter, not harder. And um, especially in the cellar, it's a very physical job. Right. Yeah. So I try to be, you know, really aware of my surroundings. And um, but as far as wine making goes, blending goes, you know, there's no difference. I've got two very close mentors. One's a man and one's a woman. And, you know, you learn something different. But I try not to let being a female get well, in the way of anything. Well, it should <laughs> never. It should oh, no, never. if anything, it's an advantage. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a little bit. I mean, you yeah. know, I, I am the only female here. There's not very many female winemakers in mm. Virginia. So it is, I, I, I stand next to a lot of women winemakers then, and they're all really talented. So I'm happy to be part of that group. What led you into it? Into winemaking? Yeah. I needed a job at the beginning, you know. <laughs> so I graduated in 2011, and I knew that I didn't want to sit at a desk. I knew I wanted to work outside, and being in Charlotte, I was already in Charlottesville, and there's a huge wine community down there. So I started working at one of the wineries, and 
fell in love with the people and obviously the place. It's so beautiful down there. It's gorgeous. But the people have always kept me interested in, in wine. Um, there's, it's such a good community of people here in Virginia, uh, both in Charlottesville and in Loudoun. So I haven't been in Loudoun too long. Uh, I just finished my third vintage there. So it's a good community up there as well. I'm, I'm happy to be part of it. Wonderful. Awesome. Well, what else yep. you got for us? Yeah. And this is the... This is uh, the 2015 Mosaic. Okay. So the Mosaic is our Bordeaux-style wine. Um, mm. It's a blend of Cabernet Franc, Merlot, and Petit Verdot. That's beautiful. I read somewhere that... Bordeaux buns are popular in Virginia winemaking. Is that true? Yes. <laughs> um, is there a reason for that? Y- yes. <laughs> so I think blending is a, a really good way to show off your, your best wines and your best sites. Um, we grow, us personally at Sunset, we, we grow a lot of Cabernet Franc and a lot of Merlot. Um, some cab sev, some PV, but it's a it's a way to, to take your best barrels and and to h- highlight them and to allow them to complement each other. Um, it's a challenge to make a single varietal, and it's a different challenge to make a blend. And blending um, can be forgiving at times, but it can also be a really big challenge to find how the different pieces work together. Um, to make an even better wine. So I, I think, yeah, the Bordeaux-style blend is really common here in Virginia. You'll see, I mean, we have uh, not only is our flagship wine, which is the Mosaic, a Bordeaux-style wine, but also our entry-level is, uh, wine is, is, a, is a blend as well. So it, like I said, you can make a lot of different styles with, with blending. Mm. Okay, we're going to ask you some fun questions now. Are you ready? Sure. Um, so we're at speed dating. If you were speed dating all of Virginia wines, which would you choose to take home with you? It can't be your own. <laughs> so um, I should be good and say Loudoun County. You know, there's, there's a lot of good producers up there. Um, Walsh Family Wine is one of them. Um, I, I've been guilty and haven't done my due diligence of going around to the Loudoun County wineries yet. We've been busy <laughs> it's with harvest. Right? It's a tough job. It's a tough job. So, uh, but one of my favorites in Virginia is Stinson. I think she does a really great job of um, on her Sauve Blanc and her Chardonnay. I'm, I'm, I'm a white wine fan myself. I drink a lot of whites. Uh, so mm. I think she, she stands out for me. And I like to visit her when I go down to Charlottesville and we'll exchange. So... Perfect. Thank you so much. So my name is Mark, Mark Mish. I'm with Ingleside Vineyards. Um, We're located on the northern neck of Virginia, about 45 minutes to the east of Fredericksburg. Um, I have two wines. I'm going to pour a 2017 Albarino and a 2014 Virginia Gold. Our Virginia Gold is going to be a blend of four different Bordeaux varietals, and our Albarino is single varietal. Um, so wonderful. All right, so let's get got, started. All right. <laughs> so many glasses. Yeah. Here, I'll just drink. It's fine. Oh, <laughs> Perfect. Oh, it's okay. We're good. We're good. Oh, you're good. Yeah, we got. That. So, what is unique about? Uh, your vineyards overall winemaking style compared to other parts of the region? Um, I don't feel in making super acidic wines. Um, a lot of people really think you, it's all about numbers. You have to have this, you have to have that. And for me, it's more about what does that wine need? How, how do we balance that wine out? Um, if some people have a super acidic wine, they'll add sugar to it. Well, for me, I'd like to get a little bit more ripeness on the, out of the berries, so we let them hang a little bit longer. And you, you see that pH go up a little bit, and that's okay for me. So we'll pick it after the pH is about, you know, 3.3, three, and that way when the wine is finished, it's around 3.5. And that's, 
that's a good number for me. And so it's very smooth, very, very balanced, not sharp and, and acidic. Um, Tasting a lot of apricot. Apricot. Really I've, coming I've heard through. Guava. I've got the minerality, mm, right. citrus. Um, right. I find it goes really well with oysters, especially mm-hmm. oysters out of the Chesapeake Bay or on the in the Pacific. Um, personal preference, raw oysters, Albarino. Mm-hmm. That's a good evening. Yeah. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's the way it goes. Um, but that's where we're located at is the highest point in the northern neck. We're also, um, we have a really good drainage. We're between two rivers, which help moderate our climate a little bit, which is between the Rappahannock and the Potomac. Um, yeah, so that's that. Great. Um, let's try the next one. 2014 Virginia Gold. So this is going to have some Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, and Merlot. Oh, here. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> got too many of these damn glasses. Too many glasses. <laughs> <laughs> Good thing there's a spit bucket. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, so our Virginia Gold, as I said, is a blend of four different Bordeaux varietals. Um, a little bit of American oak and some French oak mm-hmm. is within there to add some complexity as well as just bring that palette together. Um, it's, it's showing really well. It's aging nicely. I think it has a lot of life left in it, which is, it should. This is our, one of our premier wines that we like to say, hey, this is, we only make it in the best year. So 2014 was fantastic for us. And that was the year that we made Virginia Gold, one of them. Um, we did some in 2007, previous vintages, but this is the cream of the crop is the way we like to look at it. Um, is there anything about the Virginia winemaking region you'd like to debunk? Like, uh, you know, things, theories or things people might think? I don't know if you could tell, but I'm, I'm pretty young. Um, I was going to ask you about that, I'm, too. <laughs> I'm a pretty young individual. I don't think I have enough experience to say I can debunk this myth or that myth. What I can say is that you can make fantastic Virginia wine anywhere in the state of Virginia. With enough time and care, your vines will thrive. Um, And I think that that's important to remember. People are like, oh, you can't do anything in Virginia. You know, this is only good for tobacco and corn. And it's like, well, it's not. We're also good for growing grapes because... We, we score well, our wines present well, um, and I think that we've gotten a bad rep. I mean, we had some Virginia twang. That used to be a thing was Virginia twang in the 80s, um, which was before my time. Um, <laughs> but Doug, who's the owner of Ingleside, has been there since 1980. He started it with his father in 1980, and he's been through that Virginia twang phase and he's and that's not a common thing anymore we've learned so much as a virginia winemaking industry in the last 38 years 40 years to 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 change a lot of this so we're able to take better care of our fruit we're able to i mean we know what diseases are out there now we know what kind of bugs carry those diseases so Mm. all this stuff that we didn't know or he didn't know when he was starting out trial and error Mm. Um, if you were a wine, what kind of wine would you be? <laughs> probably, if I was to pick one, I would probably be, I'd have to say I'm a, like a dark red. I don't, I don't want to put a particular varietal because I'm not a very social person. And for me, I think wine and chocolate, like I'm going to eat that by myself or <laughs> Uh, wine and cheese or wine and crackers. I'm going to eat that by myself. I'm not sharing. So I'm not a very social person. I like to um, stay in my little hole is what my wife calls it. She works the tasting room. She manages the tasting room and I manage the winery or the cellar. So I stay in my cellar for the most part. I don't do a lot of social gatherings and go out. It's you don't come out into the light very often. No, I try not to. And normally when I do, it's like, oh, I can't see, I'm blind. But um, for the most part, it's it gives me the ability to focus on the wine and everything else. So when we do our social gatherings, like at the winery, I can help with those. I don't mind it, but that's not where I thrive. I I much prefer to be dark and and robust and alone and doing my own thing. I want to be standalone, very, very standalone. So that's, I think a a dark red wine would be that. Maybe Petit Verdot. I'm not quite that powerful, so maybe more of like a, 
a, a dark Merlot, a heavy Merlot. I just have to say your your description into this is is amazing. I love it. <laughs> Keep going. I, I have a lot of time on my hands <laughs> <laughs> to, to think. So well, and also you seem very social. Like you're yeah. saying you're not social. <laughs> just, just because I'm not I'm not socially inept doesn't mean I like it. All right. I think I'm doing it, but that's right. No, it's fine. <laughs> My name is Michael Shapps, and the winery is Michael Shapps Wineworks in Charlottesville, where we have two locations. Beautiful location. Thank you. Well, let's go ahead and taste that first one. So the first wine we're going to have today is the 2016 Michael Shapps Petit Mansang, which is a dry Petit Mansang. There you go. I don't know anything about Petit Mensang. Can you sure. talk a little bit about so that? Petit Mensang, I think, really m- might be uh, the best white grape variety for Virginia. Mm. Currently my favorite wine to grow and to make. Petit Mensang is originally from the Gironson in southwestern France, where it's usually a high-acid grape variety. And because of that high acidity, they make sweeter wines to balance right. the acidity. But here in Virginia, uh, with our climate, and uh, conditions a hot climate that we have here uh, right towards ripening those acids start to break down and we have a little more balance a little less acidity which if the season uh, allows we can pick the grapes at a good maturity and not have too much acidity and then make but make a dry wine which is what i do i I was about to say i'm I'm not a huge fan of sweet but that's sweet and dry if that's even a combination the sweetness that you're getting on the palate is actually from the alcohol unfortunately to get the balance right uh, between the alcohol, I mean the uh, acidity and and the the, the flavors that we want, um, we have to let it ripen a little bit more, which means more sugar and thus a little bit more alcohol. Mm-hmm. So this is a wine that traditionally comes in over 14% alcohol, and that alcohol is what per- you perceive on your palate as sweetness, though it's totally dry. Interesting. Yeah, and this wine is barrel fermented. And actually, the grapes are soaked on the skins overnight. Uh, prior to pressing to get a little more extraction, to get a little more aromatics, a little more uh, flavor, and then they're barrel fermented uh, in French oak, one-third of it being new. So as we try this next one, um, tell us about what is unique about your overall winemaking style. Well, I started in France, and I still actually have a winery in France. Uh, I studied winemaking in Burgundy uh, and currently have a winery in Merceau. So my approach is a little more old world. That's where I I learned and kind of take a little bit more... Uh, minimalist approach. All my wines are fermented naturally. I don't add any uh, yeast strains to the wines. Uh, these wines are uh, kind of more a little bit rustic style. All the, none of the reds are filtered. Uh, so I kind of take a little bit more of that approach. I still, you know, I'm very involved in, in winemaking in France and kind of bring that with me as I go back and forth. Mm, wonderful. Let's try that second one. Okay. <laughs> so you see a theme here. That was Petit Men saying this is Petit Verdot. Mm. And uh, similar to Petit Mensang, Petit Verdot, again, another small, berry, loose clustered variety that really does well in this climate that holds up. And traditionally a higher acid variety in Bordeaux that they use for blending because of the natural acidity. But here, the same uh, theory that uh, they come in with a little bit more balance, a little less acidity than you would find in Bordeaux. But very uh, Mm -hmm. nice tannins, very Mm -hmm. structured. Uh, this is a, a wine that uh, we age for two years in 50% new oak before releasing. This is the current release, which we just released, which is 2015. Uh, so it's already got a little bit of aging to it, but you can tell by the, the, the style, it needs a lot more time. It's pretty, pretty um, aggressive right now and it needs to mellow out some aging. So you have a lot of experience making wine, and you've made wine in France for a long time. So what's unique about Virginia's wine landscape uh yeah you know i came here in virginia there was only 40 wineries in 1995 and so now you could you know i've seen the development and i've seen the growth in all different areas of, of virginia there's some different climates different soils 
and there's a uniqueness uh, throughout the state. It's not, you know, that large of a wine region, but there's a lot of variety, which is great. A lot of different grapes you can grow in different sites. So we kind of have our own style in different regions and, and are working with varieties like this, which are not common in California or elsewhere. So we've mm. been able to develop our own little niche of varieties that work well for our climate and soil. So you said 40 when you first came here, mm-hmm. and now I think I heard someone say over, yeah, over yeah. 300. That's I've huge growth. I've been involved with a lot of startups, a lot of consulting, and there's a couple of people in the room here I've helped get started. So yeah, it's been fun. I've watched the industry grow and, and be a part of it. That's wonderful. Does the um, region that a winery in Virginia is in really affect the wine that, like, because I know there's, like, Virginia is kind of diverse in terms of landscape, right? Mm-hmm. It's like the eastern shore, the yep. mountains. Oh, um, yeah. Does that really affect yeah, the wine? Yeah, soil and, and climate, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Uh, we just purchased a winery in the Shenandoah Valley that has completely different soil types than ours in Charlottesville. And we're looking to do totally different varieties there and, and take advantage of the uniqueness of that site. Hmm. Interesting. So we are at, at the speed dating event. We have to ask you a speed dating question. Sure. If you were to date any of the wines here or any of the wines in Virginia wines other than your own, which would you take home? <laughs> got Larry did I, fl- all of a did I fluster? <laughs> did I fluster you? <laughs> yeah. No. Um, there's so many good wines. You know, I, there's, I look for the wines, the wineries I like, the ones that are consistent across the board. You know, with a one-hit wonder, the ones that have shown consistency, consistency over the years. And in this room, there's a couple, for sure. And, uh, you know, I'm really keen on, you know, new areas and new wines I haven't seen before. And so there's lots of new... What are some of those areas? Well, uh, the Shenandoah Valley is not new, but it's up and coming. That's why we went there and, and bought, a, bought a winery there, because we really feel like for viticulture, that's the ideal site to be. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's relative to the wineries in that region are are all relatively new. I mean, there's a lot of new wineries there, so it's fun to see the development. And new, it, you know, that's off the beaten path a little bit further west and not a lot of traffic, so nobody's really ventured that way, you know, in a large, you know, number of wineries. But now, all of a sudden, every year, there seems to be another winery opening up in the valley. And, and when I you think, say new, five years or less? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. There's, uh, yeah. You know, Bluestone's here. I helped them get started in, uh, when was that, 2000. Seven maybe or somewhere in there. I can't remember exactly the year, but they were, you know, the only. There were maybe two others in that area, and so uh, there's a few others that are, have come up lately. And I think that's really where uh, the great soils are. Yeah, I was going to say, what's ideal about? You said the conditions are mm-hmm. kind of ideal. The county, what, what? Uh, for example, we're in Shenandoah County is the driest county in Virginia, huh. which is important when you're growing grapes and you know rain is not uh, what you want at harvest. So it's an you know, a big difference there. And the soils are lighter soils, which also are preferable for, for growing grapes. Was this year then bad for wine? Wasn't because ideal. Of how wet it was. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Let's put it that way. It wasn't ideal. It was, it was we have some good wines. Uh, it was a little challenging, but it was, uh, but that's the fun, challenging yeah. part of it. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you Mike. So yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. My name is uh, my name is Daniele. Uh, I'm from uh, from northern Italy, from near Venice. Uh, I've moved to uh, Virginia in 2008, so it's been 10 years now. Um, sp- specifically to work at uh, Barbersville Vineyards. That's the vineyard that I represent today. Um, Barbersville Vineyards has been the longest operational winery, vineyard and winery in Virginia. Uh, first plantings in 1976, first production in 1978. We've been open uh, ever since. Uh, we are located about 15 miles northeast from Charlottesville, so about an hour and 15 minutes from downtown Richmond. Um, property is founded and owned by an Italian family, the Zonin family, who are uh, the second biggest private producers in Italy in terms of acreage and production. They have about 5,000 um, hectares, so about 10,000 acres of vineyards in Italy. Um, and... Um, Today, from Barbersville, I'm going to pour a white and a red. Vermentino is the white. Nebbiolo is the red. There are two Italian varieties. I thought it would be fun to bring them here today um, because they are unusual names. They're pe- the people are not familiar with them. They're also interesting in terms of their characteristics. And uh, so I thought uh, people would enjoy talking about them. So, Vermentino...
Vermentino, I have to say, it, it, it's not an easy name to promote. Uh, way too similar to Vermin. <laughs> We've been told that before. It's not our fault if the if the grape has that name. Uh, that's the name of the grape, originally from Tuscany, Liguria, and Sardinia. That's where it's grown mostly. Um, you said mineral. Sardinia. Sardinia, yes. yes. That's one of the main regions for Vermentino. Mm. Um, it's um, it's a grape that has a nice minerality, nice freshness, uh, a lot of fruit. Um, it ages also very well. Uh, we've we're opening now uh, bottles from 2010 and 2012 that showcase a very nice freshness, still very, very, very alive wine. Uh, it's under percent stainless steel, so there's no uh, oak or concrete um, in order to give the wine structure or ageability. Um, instead of that, we uh, we keep the wine in stainless steel and we do uh, periodical uh, lease stirring. So we mix the wine in the tank every couple of weeks to resuspend the solids. Those give a certain mouthfeel, a certain, um, um, I would say, softness to the wine without having to resource to uh, oak aging. Um, and we're actually very pleased with the results. We've been making this wine since 2010. It went through a couple of very difficult vintages, 2011, 2018, and it, uh, it showed very nice characteristics uh, in both vintages. It's delicious. Thank you. And uh, so we, th we think that, you know, for us, being an Italian winery, Vermentino is, is, um, is an interesting wine to have. Other wineries, I, I, see, I see them today here, uh, they have Albarino, mm -hmm. they have Petit Mansang. Mm -hmm. Very fun, very interesting grapes, very different characteristics. But that's what makes Virginia wine interesting as well. It's the quality first, but uh, it's the different types of... Like, if you're in Italy, you want to taste an Albarino, either you find it in a restaurant or you have to go to Spain. If you're in Virginia, you can have locally grown Albarinos, Petit Mansangs, Vermentinos. You go, you space throughout pretty much the whole of Europe. There are people in the Shenandoah that uh, use uh, German grapes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, it's, it, that's, that's the, most, the thing that's most fun about Virginia, I think. And so, we've heard a lot about uh, Bordeaux, Bordeaux style grapes being grown in Virginia, and then, as you mentioned, Albarino from Spain. Um, but nothing about Italian grapes and wine. So can you talk a little bit about how that translates growing you know, Italian mm -hmm. grapes in Virginia? Well, I Italian grapes are... There's a reason why French grapes are called international grapes. Uh, they've been used extensively in all kinds of uh, environments all over the world. Uh, Italian grapes, they've never had the same success, uh, but they don't have the same success even in Italy. Uh, Vermentino is grown in those coastal areas, but you'll never find it where I'm from, in Friuli, in the northeast. Nebbiolo, which is the red that, I, um, mm. that we're tasting now, is the same thing. You'll find it in uh, Piemonte, in Lombardy. You'll never find it in Veneto, which is 200 miles away. Mm. Uh, for the same reason, they're not very popular outside of Italy. They're not known. People don't know them. If you have to plant something, you know, Vermentino is not your first choice. Your first choice is Pinot Grigio, Chardonnay, because you know people know them. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit challenging from the marketing standpoint. It's also a little bit challenging from the production standpoint. Italian grapes are very temperamental. They don't like uh, climates and soils that are different compared to the ones where they've been selected for centuries sometimes. So, um, and Nebbiolo, for example, uh, gives us challenging um, tasks uh, because it's, uh, it's a grape that is unusual. You can see, well, your listeners cannot, but you can see the, <laughs> the color. It's very light, yeah. uh, a garnet color, a brick reflexes. This is a 2015, so it's a very young vintage. Mm. But that's the typical color of Nebbiolo. It, it'll never be, you know, dark, deep, with uh, purple reflexes. That's not what Nebbiolo is. So people expect something light, something maybe even past its prime. And it's not the case. It's actually, very, it, it's a very intense, very astringent, very tannic wine. It has both earthy and fruity aromatics. It's got a nice length to it great ageability so it's not an easy wine to present uh, people really have to taste it they have to know what they're tasting so it takes time it requires you know our presence with the people with our customers to explain it whereas you know Merlot all you need to know is the name pretty much yeah. and people already know what to expect and they are they feel safe with that product 
when they find a Biolo, Vermentino, but for us even Sangiovese or Barbera, they don't know what to expect. They may have never tasted one uh, because those, those wines, they rarely make it here from Italy as well. So, you know, it, it makes it a little challenging, but um, so. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me. Good afternoon. My name is Doug Fabioli. I'm with Fabioli Cellars. Uh, we are located in Loudoun County, Virginia, just north of Leesburg. And the wines I'm pouring today are Petite Mansang 2017, as well as the 2013 Tanat. Happy to, happy to have you. Let's get started. Oh, we can do that. Part. Tell us about uh, your winemaking process and what might make you uh, unique or different. Okay. Thank you. I've been in the wine industry now for 37 years. I refer to myself as a bootstrapper. <laughs> so didn't really have a dot com to sell behind me in order to get started. So we've gone step by step um, in uh, getting our business going. In Loudoun, when I got there, we had about four wineries and we're up to about 50. So the time I spent in California was nice to have behind me to develop my, my style as well as help the neighborhood grow and uh, get a lot of the other wineries started. So they call me the godfather. I accept that with honor. And um, You kind of look like a godfather. Thank you. I thank like you. It. It's in the blood. Yeah. It's in the blood. Yeah. So, um, so the Petit Mansang here is barrel fermented, uh, barrel aged, but it's neutral oak. So we're not getting a lot of the oak character, but what you're getting is that breathing lushness that kind of comes along with uh, the oak aging of a wine. Um, this one has a nice bright fruit aroma. You'd think that it's sweet, but when you taste it, the acid really shines through. And it's a dry wine, very food friendly. And it's also a nice, you know, as an aperitif, you can have this on the patio on one of those nice autumn days like today. Absolutely. So you said you were in California making wine originally. What? Why did you come to Virginia to make wine? We were originally for, we were from the East Coast. Okay. My wife and I grew up in upstate New York. And, uh, you know, we had a great run out there in California, but I kind of topped out. I didn't have a winemaking degree. And um, we had the opportunity to come east, um, and Virginia was just burgeoning. And um, as I say for New York, Virginia was close enough for Thanksgiving, but far enough away for Sunday afternoon. So I love my family, but I needed a little bit of space. So, um, so we made the move, and it was good to get close to family and her family as well. And really, I, I got the opportunity to be a big fish in a small pond. Mm. So by having the experience, I was able to help some of these other folks out that were starting new wineries that hadn't had the experience. And what a beautiful area you landed in. We did really, really well. And we have a great market. I mean, up in, up in Loudoun, you know, we've got the greater D.C. area that is a huge wine and, uh, uh, lovers area. And it's been a great point for us to, to start and work and grow. Yeah. Let's try that second one. Okay. <laughs> so our second wine is 2013 Tanat. Thank you. Can you talk a little bit about it? And I can you say the name again? I don't think yeah. I heard it. So the name is Tanat, T A N N A T. And the best thing to think about when you see that name, think tannins. Okay, so when we talk about tannins, there's a lot of structure to this wine. Um, you can see, as you see the bottle, this is 2013. It's lost mm. some of the, the tannins and the acids that stick into the bottle. We'll have some, some sediment on the bottom. Um, it's a little older, but it's so full of flavor that it, the, the liquid just couldn't hold it, um, and it dropped out of suspension. Um, but wow. the idea of this, it's from the, north, the southwest region of France is where the variety grows well. We are getting good recognition with our Tanats in Virginia, and uh, this one in 2011 was in the governor's case, mm. and um, uh, we got the this just got the uh, best of show in the Loudon Winery Loudon uh, Wine Competition uh, up north. That was last week, so happy to pour it and share it, and um, I'm looking forward to the 2015 because it's off the charts, and that's coming for the that's going to be in the Governor's Cup competition this this winter. That's amazing. So what? If there's anything you would like to debunk about the the image of Virginia wines, is there anything you'd like to go I, into? I think that people need to taste. 
And they need to taste our best. I mean, when you, you know, some of our, our bigger wine festivals, they're more of a party rather than a wine tasting. And some, an event like this really gives you the opportunity to taste what we have best. But we want our, our, our approachable stuff, too. We've got to work our pricing a little bit. Um, we want to make sure we, we're charging, you know, some of our wines are a little more costlier than others. And that's a little tougher for people to say, well, it's my first time and i got to pay this. Mm. So some of the wines may be a little more price point oriented, um, but there are going to be some other wines that will match right up with these higher end, you know, the, the cult wines out of California. And uh, mm-hmm. we're happy to have that level of quality. So I think it's the approachability. We want our wines to be enjoyed and, and uh, just fun. So, this is a different kind of question. Um, if you were a wine, what would you be? You know, I, it's for me, it's kind of easy, and it's hard. I, I, I'm Zinfandel. I am definitely Zinfandel. Big My challenge and bold. is big, bold, jammy, approachable, yeah, jammy. non-pretentious. <laughs> yeah. Cab Franc could be too. Cab Franc mm. is the Zin of the East. It's a tie. And my challenge <laughs> has been I can't grow Zin in Virginia. Mm. I do bring in some fruit from California and make some Zins, but I have definitely embraced the Cab Franc grape, gotten some great recognition for that, and done the best I can uh, with it. And again, it's not pretentious. It's not overdone. It's it's it, There's some some earthiness and grit to it and there's certainly some of that through me right so good question i like that (laughs) well here's another one for you we are speed dating after all yes okay i gotta hear your answer on this so what would be the wine you would take home with you out of all the virginia wines other than your own during speed dating Ooh. Well, you know, I'm teasing my the guy that's going ahead of me. So that that <laughs> Barbersville Vermentino oh. is one that really was exciting to me. It's kind of, you know, you've got the regular stuff that you know, and I'm a red guy. I love my reds. But then you go and do something a little kinky. So I think that that Vermentino being that light, bright white, mm. it's like, okay, I'll be, uh, you know, vicarious. Let's try it. My name is Lee Hartman. I'm the winemaker at Bluestone Vineyard. Uh, We're a family farm in the Shenandoah Valley, just south of Harrisonburg. Uh, And the wines that I'm pouring today are, are, um, uh, both of them are estate grown, both from 2017 are uh, barrel fermented Chardonnay and our uh, wine we call the Steep Face. Oh, I can't wait to hear more about that. Yeah. Let's try them. <laughs> All right. Are these the... Just, yeah, just we were, yeah. We're all friends we're here. All, yeah, <laughs> we're, all, we're all sharing germs at this point. That's why al- alcohol is good to have yeah, on hand. Exactly. <laughs> So this is our Chardonnay, uh, harvested from 2017, which if you've had any of that today, uh, I'm sure you've heard was an amazing vintage. Uh, it was real easy going. Uh, the, the, wow. For us, the vintages that make the best wines are the ones that are the easiest uh, in the cellar. Um, so this one is probably, these two are probably the highest elevation wines you'll have today. Uh, our vineyard peaks out at 1,400 feet, um, which is um, uh, you know, one of the characteristics we love about the Shenandoah Valley. We have high elevation. We're one of the driest parts of the state. We're protected in the west by the Allegheny Mountains, and on the east we have the Blue Ridge Mountains. And that protects us from uh, weather events that come down from the Great Lakes and from Canada, as well as the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic. So the mountains protect you, but does the actual elevation affect the taste of the wine? Sure. Yeah. So um, at higher elevations, you're going to have less humidity, uh, and that's going to end up having, uh, you know, less incidence of rot, of, of mildew. Uh, these are these are things that all vineyards have to deal with in one way or another, but uh, for us, it's a little bit less pressure. Uh, another really nice thing about it is that at that elevation, we are consistently about five degrees cooler than Charlottesville, mm-hmm. and so that, that means that uh, we have cooler evenings, cooler days. Um, our Chardonnay comes in the door uh, probably about a week later than theirs, so we at that part of the season, we have uh, a little bit of extra ripening. Um, but at the same time, since it's cooler, it's not baking the fruit while it does that. 
Right. Yeah. I, I really love working with barrel fermented Chardonnay because if you work with a tank, you get to work with one batch. And if you're working with barrel fermentations, I get to work with 24 small batches. And I get to make this barrel a little different than that one. We'll try something new here. Uh, and then when you actually blend it all together, even though it's all Chardonnay, it all comes from the same hill. Uh, it's kind of its own unique blend um, because of, of what you've been working with. Great. Let's try the next one. All right. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> so you've got to tell us about the name, the so, Steep Face. So this is the 2017 Steep Face. Uh, and that's steep face, S T E E P face. F A C E. So um, we decided for this wine to name it not after what it is, but from where it comes. So we decided the western part of our hill, it's one of the steepest sites uh, for Virginia vineyards. Uh, we can't put a tractor on it. Um, when we harvest it uh, in September, usually, uh, we end up picking it all by hand, and all 9,000 pounds need to come off the hill 30 pounds at a time. That's complex. It's, yeah. And so, it's got a lot going so, on. So we, we bring the fruit in. Um, after, after a growing season, you know, even if we get an inch of rain one afternoon, most of that water is going to wash right off down to the corn or the soybeans below us. And, uh, and that's really evident this year in 2018. We, we had lots of rain, but the fruit that came in from that site is, is still really great. Um, uh, we bring that fruit in. Uh, it's also on the western side of the hill, um, which means that it, during the summer, there are days where it sees the sun until 9 o'clock at night, which is pretty, pretty awesome. Uh, when we bring the fruit in, we, uh, we don't crush into stem all of it. We leave about 40% whole cluster, which means that there are stems in this wine. Uh, that's, that bunch of stems gives it some structure. It gives it a little lift. And it also has a lot of whole berries. So those berries um, kind of give a candied flavor to it, some good acid uh, that, that's going to make this really friendly with food. And then we put it in barrels where uh, they're, they're old barrels and you taste the wine, not the wood. Sorry, that was a lot. No, <laughs> it's so good. It's good I had stuff. coffee for lunch, so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You did, oh, you, you had breakfast. You had I, cheesy I eggs and bacon. Yeah, and then I drove That's a couple hours to get here. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So if you were a wine, a couple of fun questions. Okay. If you were a wine varietal, what would you be? Um... I uh, we love stumping people. Yeah. Oh man, that's that's hard. So, I, I really love working with Chardonnay. Um, although I, I don't know what that says about my personality <laughs> necessarily. Um, it's my mom's favorite wine. <laughs> so, oh. but, um, maybe okay. Cab, maybe Cabernet Franc. I think Cab Franc is really cool because when people think of Bordeaux, they think of you know either Merlot or Cab, right. and it's like those are the two camps that you're in and i, I kind of like the the third way even though even though in virginia that is like the, the bordeaux grape but mm. i think in the in the general context of the wine world yeah I, I i'm gonna go with cab franc yeah we'll go with that good choice yeah um i want to ask you a question about um your vineyard before when you were when you said you're from bluestone vineyard yeah you said we're a small family farm mm -hmm. you didn't say we're a winery we're a vineyard. so can you talk a little bit about that like is the why did you describe it as a family farm? So I think I think a lot of people um, see wine in magazines and they see it in restaurants, and it's this very um, uh, fancy sort of beverage that that people have when they're celebrating something. And I, I think that that's great, and I think it is something that should be celebrated too. But most days, I, I don't go to museums in Richmond and pour wine. Uh, for people, I, I wear Carhartts and I drive a tractor, and and that's what we do. Uh, today is just a lot of fun, but 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 mostly we're a farm more than anything. And our winery is just a barn. It's where we process everything. My mom my mom grew up on a dairy farm, and she's like, you know, this is that's it's the same thing. It all comes from dirt. Yeah, and that's why I do it. Thank Love you. it. Yeah, thanks guys. <laughs> Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network on tour and joining us on our journey to meet a Virginia wine mate. Thanks again to our sponsor, Virginia Wine, for making our coverage of Fire, Flower, and Fork possible.